All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here on this Tuesday. Uh, welcome to our medical director open forum, where we hope that we can have an open conversation, answer any and all questions about your health protocols for the upcoming summer. Um, just as a shameless plug, we have a couple webinars that you're definitely not going to want to miss coming up. So next Wednesday, we have a medical town hall on the mental, emotional, social health factors and support for children with cancer. And that's hosted by Dr. Karen Long Trainer, who is a clinical psychologist at Rutgers Can Cancer Institute of New Jersey. And then on April 27th, if you remember, uh, Dave Malter, who ran our COCA Academy at COCA-Con last year, he is coming back to teach us staff training best practices as we all prepare for our summer. So without further ado, I am joined by Dr. K and Tammy Jenkins, who will be our moderators for tonight's discussion. So I'll pass it over to them. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. So we don't have a specific agenda. We wanted this to be open for us to talk, brainstorm, share ideas, share problems, and, and go from there. So who wants to be first to start us off? Well, first, this is not a question or anything, but I wanted to just say again, thank you to COCA for last week's uh, town hall meeting with the discussion about the medical town hall with the discussion about the variants. We had some really great conversation about, you know, what people are doing with their camps. So that was an excellent presentation. So thank you so much for that. And remember, Did anybody else get to go? If you didn't get a chance to watch, they're recorded, so you can still see them. So how about, you know, one question that I would like to know just from a real basic standpoint is, is everyone, or I'm not sure how to, if I should phrase it in the positive or the negative, but is everyone planning on trying to hold an in-person overnight camp so far this summer, or is there anyone that's not that wants to share that because I womp womp have to say that we're we're is still waiting for final decision but it's not looking good with the decision making and so I'm kind of heartbroken about that but um so I just wondered if everybody is there's anybody else that's feeling my pain it doesn't seem like it seems like everybody's going to be having fun so Which we state are, are you in Virginia we are doing a camp, we're doing in person, but we decided to divide it in half. So normally it would be a week long camp. We're gonna do two, basically three day sessions and divided by age group. Um, so, because we wanted to cut down our numbers, we're doing about half our numbers. Okay. So we are gonna do in person, but we're doing it with a couple of caveats to make it a little easier to manage everything. Well, so far our plan is we're not gonna do overnight, but they're gonna do a set of three days in three different regions because we have kids from all over the place. So we're gonna do like day camp um, and then have program like the fire or virtual programming in between the sessions. So we will have something, but not overnight camp. Hey, it's Stu Kaplan. First of all, sorry my uh, video isn't working um, from Can't Make a Dream in Montana. We are moving forward with eight sessions. We are flying um, uh, kids and young adults in. And I think you've all seen on the chats um, uh, from Jennifer and from me that we cannot mandate vaccines, nor can we know for 100% whether our participants and or our staff are vaccinated, which obviously makes it much more difficult. We can ask the question. We can't require the answer. Um, we're doing small groups, we're cohorting, we're masking indoors, um, and we're taking week to week and reevaluating our COVID uh, guidelines. Luckily, our first program, which is next weekend, is an adult caregivers program that's got eight couples. So it's a great way for us to kind of tie the waters. But our current plan is to have our general maximum capacities between 60 and 65. We're gonna have no more than 40 campers or participants. Um, and do the best we can with cohorting and, uh, and spacing. We're gonna require testing before they get there and then we're gonna do it symptomatically. What are other folks doing? Camp Boggy Creek in Florida 
we are we've downsized our numbers as well. Uh, normal normal summers we could host up to 145 campers. Uh, we targeted maybe 64 campers this summer with the way applications are coming in and with the uh, difficulty of hiring staff. We're going to be happy if we get 30 to 35 kids a week for six weeks as opposed to eight weeks. We are requiring all the staff and the campers to be vaccinated. And in the state of Florida, where masks and vaccines are very political, it's very challenging for us. But uh, we have to move forward to do it right and do it safe. Hello. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're taking things slow and uh, we'll learn from it this year so we can grow back. We've, we've just uh, got a brand new CEO as well. And uh, he's very supportive of us doing it safely, doing it slow. So the next three years, we can build back the capacity like we used to. But, but doing it right and learning a lot of lessons is our key. So we've done some deep dives into how we're doing the food service, the cohorts and the cabins. Um, yeah, it's a lot of complex um, decision-making because the uh, uh, county health department, the governor, uh, uh, people give us different directions all the time on so what's best with the testing from pre-testing to day of arrival to how far into it. Uh, it's very challenging. So we are just still taking it slowly, but uh, at least we know we're not gonna be pressured by having a certain amount of numbers this year. Beverly, you're muted if you were talking. Uh, let's see, we've got in the chat, um, Jordan said they're doing a split week family style camp along with a virtual camp weekend and a camp and box, excuse me, camp in a box options for those who can't join us in person. Um, Cindy said Ronald McDonald camp doing both virtual and in-person in August, crossing our fingers. <laughs> Tammy, you have an invitation to go to Susan's camp too. <laughs> I know, I love it. I love it. There's a, yeah, I think, you know, it's always difficult because it's the planning and then there's always the chance, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Some of our discussion was, well, camp is in eight months. This was back in January when we first started talking about it. And eight months before that, we didn't even know about Delta. Um, and then we went through Delta and Omicron. So it, it is a little bit you know, not who knows what's going to happen between now and and summertime. Hopefully, nothing horrible. But as we had our last discussion with the loved children of Omicron A and Omicron B, or <laughs> yeah. as he was talking about it, or son of Omicron, who knows? What other questions, things people are working on, want to talk about? So I'll say uh, Happiness is Camping, we're offering five weeks of overnight camp as well as a weekend of family camp. We are requiring vaccines. Um, we were originally requiring boosters, but as of last night, our medical council decided to uh, just require the first two. And then obviously if they're immunocompromised, that, that also means the first three. So following the CDC's definition of fully vaccinated, and I think they made that decision because our enrollment has been incredibly slow. Um, in the state of New York and New Jersey, um, ages, I think five to 17 are only about 24% vaccinated. And from what our oncologists are saying, they think that's much lower for uh, children with cancer as well. So it kind of didn't make sense that we're limiting our pool too much, especially because last year when we offered camp, the vast majority of our kids weren't vaccinated. So I think we would just use those policies and the number one being testing, testing, testing before they come on arrival and then while they're at camp as well. Ryan, what about your staff? Are you doing anything with boosters, requiring boosters for them? Yes, we're going to require boosters. Our medical council said just that they're okay if they're fully vaccinated, but we most of our staff is boosted already. So I'm just going to say, just get boosted. Yeah. What about staff members that have had Omicron? Are you insisting they get boosted? Yeah, we're doing it for everyone. So the vaccine mandate is pretty much, uh, Dr. K and I were just talking about, it. it's pretty much everybody's got to get it. And if you have a medical exemption, um, we run it by our medical council and basically our medical council wants to go and talk to 
their primary oncologists and and see what the situation is. So that's kind of where we're at. I guess some of it would also maybe depend on if they if they just got if they just got over COVID and then tested negative several you know once or twice then you wouldn't want them to get boosted right before they come to camp and they probably wouldn't be eligible for it because they're you know wanting a 90 day thing in there. Um, but anything beyond the 90 days, I would say, yes, they have to get, regardless of when they had Omicron, they need to get boosted. Does anybody Not else want to crest any problems with that? Certainly the recommendation that we've heard from our ID docs last week was boosters were still worth it, even if you'd had COVID. So assuming the timing, as you said, Tammy. Yeah. Yeah, at Camp One Step, we're actually um, requiring boosters, if eligible, across the board. So campers and staff, um, we'll see how it plays out. Right now, we have 85 kids <clears throat> signed up for, that's just as I'm looking right now, 85 camp, kids signed up for our summer camp, which is um, split into two one-week sessions. So I don't know how that falls out. We are limiting our numbers to around 100 which is about a 50% occupancy on our campsite. Normally we have 200 to 220 at any given time. So our staff um, so far looking good. Our staff are almost all, I think by now this it's filtered down that staff know that they have to be, you know, fully up to date on their vaccine. So I don't think they're even applying if they're not. From a camper family perspective, um, it's definitely a lot of, kind of chasing down to see where people are at and are they planning to get the booster or about, I think five of those kids that applied for summer camp haven't been vaccinated. So it's trying to figure out, are they planning to get them scheduled? One of our long-term um, follow-up nurse practitioners did tell us that we, we were increasing their interest by campers um, with vaccines because the kids wanna to go to camp. She said, we've, we're finding that a lot of kids are coming in that weren't previously vaccinated asking to be vaccinated so they can go to camp. So maybe it's doing some good, who knows? I've definitely had the emails of, I'm disappointed, I'm devastated, I'm, you know, <clears throat> how can you force kids to be vaccinated? I mean, there's, you definitely had a few of those emails that you have to respond to, but I think overall it's been good. We're also doing a sibling camp, a one week of sibling camp in June. Um, and we're getting ready to do a family camp in April. So that's just going to be some one day kind of visits instead of overnight for our family. Normally we do overnights for families, but we're just going to do kind of a day and we've got a Chicago day camp planned in May. So we've got a lot coming up. Um, we are still being fairly strict. Um, so as I said, vaccinations, we're still doing cohorting. Um, we have pretty much gotten rid of masking outdoors. Um, if somebody's just in transit to their room, they don't have to put a mask on, but if they're actually sitting down indoors, which we're not encouraging, um, they do, you know, if the group's sitting down indoors, they do need to wear a mask still. Um, so we're testing to stay. So if somebody does come down with COVID, the exposed kids will have the option of testing to stay at camp versus um, going home because of exposure. So anyway. We're still continuing a lot of strictness. We are going to open up our cafeteria. Um, we're going to open up our, our, we've had a lot of discussions about dining. So last year we did all box lunches and everything was prepackaged. We're still going to do a lot of prepackaged, but we are going to let them come through the dining hall to a served buffet instead of everybody helping themselves and then take it outside to eat. I always love the question, how can you force a child to be vaccinated? not forcing them. I'm just setting rules for camp. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm that not was my really forcing you to do anything. <laughs> that was yeah. my response, Dr. K. I said, you know, we're not, I said, we recognize it's a personal choice and that's why we're continuing our virtual programming. So you will have a choice as to whether or not to come in person or go to the virtual. Yeah. But yeah, I even got the discrimination word thrown at me too. So huh? Well, that's when you say camp is a privilege, not a right. And it's free. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is it's my personal up. opinion, by the way, not Coca, just so I'm clear. <laughs> my personal opinion. We'll have the running thing across yeah. the bottom. <laughs> All views expressed are only of the person sharing them. <laughs> but, uh, let's see. Stuart's asking if we can share strategies for testing during camp. 
scheduled surveillance, symptomatic only, on-site or off-site. Beverly's answer it said on-site antigen self-test at arrival. Um, our last meeting, I had never heard of the equipment that Dr. Rafi shared. I'm going to try to get that system so we can do it on-site and not have to chase down the uh, PCR testing prior to them coming. We're going to do it on arrival. So I'm, I'm kind of curious about that because I was talking with my group about that afterwards and and wondering, I, I guess you could use it for arrival if you have your times really spread out right. because it's going to be like well, a, it, take about it ties up the machine and does it once at one at a time. Yep. So yeah, I guess that would just kind of work for arrival if you've got, ours are usually multiple sites and multiple people, but I think that's great. Is anybody doing a, like a PCR that then they bring proof of PCR with them? It looks like probably for Susan's camp, she said PCR prior, oh, prior yeah. do not arrival and if symptomatic. So we're coordinating through Heat Healthcare, um, which is out by Ryan. And um, so everybody will get a saliva test kit sent to their home and then they'll overnight it back to the lab. And so the lab will report it directly. The family can oh, access nice. it and I have access as the administrator to the lab results. Okay. So that's really good. And then, um, and then we do the rapid antigen ourselves. We also um, are, we did it last year too, but we did a PCR prior to departure just to kind of say everybody left healthy. And I think we're probably gonna do that again. And again, that will be done. We'll swab um, on departure. Those will be sent overnight to the lab and then we'll get reported out the results within 48 hours. And is that your healthcare system or uh, where did you make this arrangement through? So it's through Heat Healthcare. It's not our healthcare system. Okay. I um, Last year, I interviewed a whole bunch of different labs that were seeking um, camps for, you know, they wanted to do testing with them. And okay. I went through a lot and I heard, it, heard about this one through an ACA um, webinar and I chatted with them and I just felt like it was a really good fit. So it's costing us some money to do that, but they actually do all my reporting. So I don't have to hassle with the state of Wisconsin reporting and all that kind of stuff. So um, that in itself um, is definitely time consuming. They switch labs this year that they're working with and it sounds like it's gonna be a little smoother um, this year too. So less, less work on our part. Very nice. That's great. Yeah, Susie, I don't know what it's like with Heat Health, but we're using uh, Diligent and their parent company is called VertiMD. It's the same type of company. And they just told us today that they're requiring this a whole online portal where campers have to upload their insurance cards and sign consent forms and fill in all their personal information for everybody coming. And it's basically as long as our online application for campus and i'm not able to just give them the information that we have for camp they have to re-upload it twice into their portal and i know for a fact that our parents are not going to do it twice so now it sounds like we may be pivoting to just doing the rapid test on our own okay so um we can do it either way our family it wasn't a long application process through heed last year but they did have to go into their portal and um submit some information but it didn't take a long time so we didn't have a lot of complaints about that so susan anyone it sounds like have, oh sorry go ahead Kay. i was just going to say did anyone have issues that did this last year with insurance companies not wanting to pay for the asymptomatic screening tests before camp i thought uh, of that when you said they were uploading their insurance cards 100 percent coverage for everybody um, the only, I'm concerned this year, Dr. K, because if we lose some of the funding, um, I think insurance companies may kick back. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think it, it could offset the charge to us versus the insurance if, if funding, you know, changes for testing and things like that. Sure. Anyone else have issues with that as far as pre-tests or feel like you're running into any problems with that? Yeah, we were told by our testing company that um, the CARES Act ended. So anybody who doesn't have um, insurance, they have to pay out of pocket for their tests, which they didn't have to do last year. So 
Medicare, Medicaid is still still applies, but if they just don't have any insurance, which believe it or not, some of our kids don't, um, that they would have to pay out of pocket. So that's another issue that we're running into this year that we didn't have last year. Oh, that's that's an important one because I think, you know, we were kind of assuming or still going off the thing that everybody can get tested for free and it's not a big deal um, because we had talked about, well, you know, I had mentioned the PCR machine and and one of the questions I got was, well, if somebody tests positive when they're at camp, aren't we just going to send them home? Like, let's just get them out of there. And I, instead of the, the testing to stay, it's like if they have symptoms and we do a rapid and it comes up positive, we're going to send them home. And if they need a PCR, they can get it at home. Um, but that might not be an option for some people. So, you know, do we provide that as kind of a community service? I don't yeah. know if anybody else has run into that. We're, we sent, we're sending our kids home if they're sick at all, just to keep the camp yeah. healthy. But I think testing them before they leave and knowing whether or not it's COVID or not just allows you to figure out what you're going to do with the kids that are staying that were exposed yeah. in that port. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the real benefit that, that you know what you're, you're dealing with. I, I love the concept of that machine, but I just can't imagine how you could use the machine that Dr. Rafi talked about in your check-in process. It, if you're trying to keep the kids separated from others until you know their test results, which is what we've tried to do with our rapid antigens on arrival. Um, so I think only doing one at a time would be, it would take your healthcare team all day. We've been drawing maps and trying to figure out where we can have them wait while they wait for their results. So yeah. Yeah. Well, so Susan, with your testing to stay, how are, you, how are you managing your kind of quarantining of the people that have been exposed? How long, given that COVID can take a couple of days? Right, so, well, so first of all, the, the benefit here with test to stay is, is we're requiring vaccinations for everyone. So all of our campers will be vaccinated and our counselors. Yeah. And so, you know, and they're working in cohorts. And so we still got to figure out a few logistics, but <clears throat> if they decide that they want to stay, they will get like a rapid antigen test done every morning okay. um, to determine kind of their status. And I think our initial, we're only going to be together for five days at a time. So, you know, the likelihood is if you've tested somebody and they're negative on arrival and, and then they turn positive at camp, it's probably going to be a few days in. So then you're only going to have a few days left in which to test, but we're still going to let them continue to do um, their activities, but they just won't be able to mix with another cohort. So we, we mix with another co cohort or two in from a social distancing. So we've picked and choose, chose what activities they can do um, with their cohorts. And typically it's like volleyball. So one cohort's on one side of the net. The other is on the other side of that, things like that, that, that allow that distance. So they just won't be able to do pod-based activities. All of their activities will be just within their cohort itself. Okay, great, thanks. And I don't so, think there's a right or a wrong on anything. I mean, no. it's, it's, it's all kind of a moving target. And, you know, I think you just have to figure out what works best for you. And um, I've had a fairly we've had a fairly conservative medical team making decisions that are now starting to recognize that we have to just move forward because we only have done last summer in person and we just made a decision this year that we were going to be in person for our programs and we would just have to figure out for each program how that looks. So a lot of our traditional programs aren't traditional. So Chicago Day Camp is typically three days in a row and this year we're doing one day in person and one day virtual because we just didn't want to have to manage how do you deal with they go home at night and they come back and do you test every day and you know it's and we were concerned about the five to ten year olds which is the age group we cater whether or not they would be vaccinated but pleasantly surprised we've had 25 applicants and only one is not vaccinated so they'll do right. they'll only do virtual We've struggled back and forth with our medical uh, director trying to make decisions about our, our cohorts are smaller. It's only eight kids in a cabin, but uh, if 
a month or so ago, we decided if one counselor or staff in that cabin or if one kid got COVID in that cabin, that the entire cabin would go home. We, uh, we we prompted in our literature for staff to have a plan B transportation to exit camp. And now we're struggling with, well, they think that they can test somebody and, and uh, watch them symptomatically and keep them, just pull that one individual out apart and isolate. And uh, the more, the further we get into this, the more complex it gets. And so we've not resolved that yet. So we don't know if we're actually sending them a cabin home or just the individual yet. So I think here in the next few weeks, we got to make a hard decision, but it's, it's very difficult to nail that down. And I also, I, I, I don't know if anyone else has come to this place, but I think it's important that it be said before we go into the summer or before any of us, certainly we've said it internally before we have a positive case because we likely will, um, that we can do all the scenario planning in the world. Um, and in fact, I mean, we were all, when we started this in November, we're all data driven, we're gonna be numbers, we're gonna look at prevalence. And then, you know, they're getting on planes from all over the country, they're changing planes in another place. It all goes out the window and we just need to make the best decision we can. We've done a lot of scenario planning, but the scenario that happens isn't gonna match any of the planning that we did. And we need to give ourselves grace in advance that we didn't think of it. And then that's why we're smart people doing what we do. And we'll just think on the fly. Um, hopefully we won't have to, but it'll be okay if we do. I totally well agree. Said. Totally agree. And, and I think what's really important is that early recognition that somebody's getting sick. Um, yeah. You have to expect you're going to have somebody get sick, whether or not it's with COVID or not. But through our education of both the counselors and, you know, hopefully that'll be, you know, in the medical team and stuff that will be identified really early. Those kids will get pulled um, and hopefully you'll prevent the spread throughout campus. So. David, I, I'm toying with the idea of one kid would go home. If I have two positive in the cohort, they'd all go home hoping I can, again, that's with some of the caveats that have been said, if we catch them quickly and, you know, get that individual isolated, but that's what I think we're going to try is if it's only one kid that you would let that one go home, but keep the cohort and the two pop up, then they're all going home. The nice thing is for us, our camps are going to be about three days long. So by the time I get it started out, they're all going to have to go home anyway. So, you know, <laughs> Hey, right now we're just giving it a shot. So we're going to see what happens. This and is David, very, uh, our, our, plan last year, our plan last year was exactly that. If one person got sick in the cohort, everybody was going to go home. That was, that was what we had placed. Fortunately, we didn't have anybody get sick. Um, so everybody got to stay. But, you know, again, I think there was a level of comfort in that for us last year. Yeah. I have a question about arrival. Um, this is the first time we didn't run an in-person camp last year, but is there any um, room for the false positive situation? So a PC, a prior, like a 72 hour negative PCR, and then someone arrives and has a positive rapid with no symptoms. It, is it an absolute no, or is there, do you give another? I'm just not sure how to handle completely asymptomatic with, with a prior negative PCR. <laughs> that one's tough. Yeah, I'm just picturing uh, the poor kid with his suitcase and everything like, <laughs> you know, cause you right. have a counselor who's now attached to bunks. Like does everybody yeah. have like a pool of counselors that are standing ready that are not assigned for instance, to a bunk? Because if that counselor, if a counselor walks in with a positive test, they need to go home. So now you'd have a cat, you know, you have understaffing in a bunk. We do have that. We have, um, we're, we're overstaffing elsewhere in a staff cabin, but we're actually not. And, you know, this conversation makes me wonder, maybe we'll change. But I, as of now, we are not doing antigens on arrival for that very reason, for the false positive reason. Um, but we're also the biggest risk because we're bringing people in from everywhere to do it. So we've thought long and hard about it. And as of today, 
we're not, um, but that that could that could change. But the staffing thing, yeah, we do have um, we do have staff on standby that would be program staff normally that we would put into a cabinet if that came to be. But it's a perfect example of we can plan for all the best. Mm -hmm. And if the cohort is they took the bus from point A to point B, and that's not the cohort we started with, then it's a whole new cohort that we didn't plan for. Mm -hmm. So the other thought, Cindy, would be is in that situation, if you have a hospital lab close by that could run a true PCR for you rapidly, that might be something to look into. We had a lab, um, oh, 20 minutes from camp, and they could turn around a PCR in about an hour. So, you know, that might be something to think about. It also might be where that machine that uh, Dr. Rafi talked about last week could come in handy because you could actually then run a PCR on site. There's also um, Lucera makes a, um, it's a, a NAT uh, test. So it's not a true PCR, but it's very, uh, the, the results are pretty consistent with um, the PCR type results. And it's a little more expensive. They're about 75 bucks a test, but that's what I'm actually using for my day camps um, where I'm only doing a test the night before they come in and I'm not doing like all the PCR lab stuff. So that could be something else, but I would probably see if a lab close by could could run a test while you just hold your camper or staff member. Um, there does tend to be, I think Bev put it in the chat too, but you do tend to see more rap, more false negatives um, than positives. Right. The issue That's that we I was had, gonna... yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, I don't know that there's a, I shouldn't, because I, I don't know statistics, I shouldn't venture into this, but I think you are more likely to get a false negative than a false positive yeah. with these tests. And so, you know, remember kids can shed even when they're asymptomatic. So I guess if you had a negative PCR and now a positive test, I'd be concerned that they had converted in between that PCR test and entrance. And I'd be pretty hard pressed to let them stay. I mean, that's a pretty big risk to take with a positive test. They also don't recommend if you've had somebody who's had COVID on the CDC website, if they've had COVID within the past 90 days, they they recommend that you not do a PCR um, because it it there's a good chance it will be positive, even though they they won't be shedding viral viral load. But um, so you may that may be one of the questions that you ask is uh, prior when you're arranging your testing. And in that case, you might do some serial rapid antigens or just do a rapid antigen and see what you get. But I think if a rapid were to come up positive in that situation, it'd be more likely to consider they've been infected with a new variant. The PCR tends to stay positive longer than the rapid from what I'm, what I remember. How about um, with, you guys have talked about all of the, you know, having some extra staffing for counselors and things like that so that you can pull one and put them into a new room if you need to. What about your medical staff? How are you guys doing on, has, has the, the, the pull on hospitals and stuff lightened up enough that you've been able to get your regular volunteers or are you feeling strapped? And do you have a backup plan for if one of them gets COVID? We have hired four for the summer we think we can get by with two, so we do have a built-in extra, but that's a big concern because uh, they're going to be in their own co cohort bubble themselves, and if it spreads rapidly, we're, we're in trouble. Well, that's kind of what I've wondered about with the, you know, if they cohort, but in terms of like distributing medications and caring for the kids, they're going to be interacting within multiple cohorts. Um, yeah, well, no, uh, we, we have, uh, we're only doing eight cabins, so how those okay. four that each nurse is going to go actually take care of two cabins. Now, if we lose one or two of those, that it broadens into uh, that each nurse is taking care of up to four cabins. So it gets riskier as we go into it. But again, it's one of those uh, got a plan. We yeah. change it as we as a diminishing <laughs> uh, changes. We adapt and, and really going in and keeping our fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to do the same. I'm going to assign nurses to cohorts and try not to cross over. Again, knowing that I may have to shuffle with numbers. Our biggest challenge I think is gonna be um, having enough people to help us do check-in. 
and how does that look for testing or yeah. you know all the things that we need to do so we're having some issues coming up with enough people for that um but yeah we're going to cohort our medical well, our nurses for me i'll so i'm there as the camp physician i'll be the only provider on site i'm probably the bigger risk and i'm not quite <laughs> sure how i'm going to cover that you because know, we we tend to operate with more nurses and then just one or maybe two providers, probably just one with the numbers now. So yeah. I don't find I have to run around in a papper or something. I'm joking, but I, no, I was I, just thinking, I was like, okay, <laughs> nurse, nurse, hey, she has to be. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I was thinking, well, how, does anybody know where you can rent a, an astronaut suit? <laughs> <laughs> how have big... you avoided COVID, Dr. K? <laughs> yeah. How have I avoided it? Well, mm -hmm. Basically, I just live in a mask all the time. I mean, I'll do the same like I do at work. Is I'll you know be more likely to be in a mask and hand washing, all those things. So, at this point, I'm I figure and boosted. So, I figure I'm going to either get a vaccination or have COVID every year for the rest of my life. But once a year, I think is enough. Yeah. <laughs> but I live in Arizona, so. <laughs> Has the um, incidence of, you know, with the amount of med staff you're going to be able to have, has that changed the care that you usually provide or are you still going to be able to provide the same level of care? Is there like, have you had to make changes of that we're not going to take kids on active treatment where we would need to give them certain medications at camp or? We took kids on, yeah, we took kids on active treatment last year and planning to this year. We are looking at their counts ahead of time. You know, obviously if they had an ANC of zero, I probably would not <laughs> encourage them to come to camp. Yeah. So if they're really in that high risk group, but um, last year we, all the kids had pretty good counts and it wasn't a, a huge issue for them. Um, we are, I am seeing, um, so I typically have a large medical staff because we decentralized to our small programs many years ago, but um, I am seeing a lot of my, people I can plan on for a week saying, I'm just not sure I can get a week off this year. It's probably only going to be three or four days. So yeah, I'm definitely seeing it. I'm, I'm getting a lot of interest from new people, but you know, that's that fine balance of how much new with returning can you actually kind of handle in the cohort model, you know, and you're putting them in a cohort kind of by themselves. It, it just doesn't give them that same level of support that I like to do if they're working more in a team based model. And so um, that that's something that I'm trying to look at right now. Susan, I feel your pain. I am worried because, you know, if this year doesn't work out for us, that's one thing, but that'll mean we've missed three camps. And by the time we get there, I mean, I'm just watching everybody get married off, moving, taking new jobs. And, you know, it's going to be four years in between when we had our last camp. And I'm really concerned about getting the experienced people back. Um, I think there will be a few that are going to be willing to, you know, to, to return and are going to be available, but, but you're right. I mean, trying to implement camp with a whole bunch of, not only will all of our kids that are usually eligible will have already aged out or, or maxed out, you know, been off treatment for so long, or our, our staff are going to be um, kind of moving on. And I do worry about having brand new people and then trying to put them into cohorts and things like that. So, so let me know how it goes. <laughs> do you predominantly look for peds onc nurses or do you look at other specialties? We, we typically have a whole variety. We're very fortunate okay. too that we get to have a pretty large med staff. So I get people from, because we have older kids and adolescents too, I get peds onc, adult onc. Um, and then we get, I have some ER nurses yeah. and uh, some you know, general med surge or, or oncology, you know, basic like that. So it, it's nice to have kind of a cadre. We try to do that with our physicians too, just to get multiple disciplines covered. Well, I love For, the mix of skill sets, which is what it's we It's awesome. Do. For a while we had a, um, I'm not sure if he's going to come back, but we had an orthopedic surgeon and that was awesome. He didn't contribute to the oncology piece one iota, but man, he was there to help out all the adults who, you know, did stupid stuff playing with the kids and ended up, you know, tearing ACLs and breaking things. 
<laughs> yeah, I love when the ER, we had a kid swallow a ring battery and the ER doc just God. jumped into, he was in high gear, man. Was yeah, like, hey, it's like it. my moment has arrived. Yeah. I was going to say one place you might look, um, see if there's like a school, local school nurse association. I yeah. think that's always a, a good place. They're, they're free in the, in the summer. So that's sometimes... Well, and Kay, that's what I had heard at one of our previous town halls that someone, I forgot who it was, was talking about it, that they used students to do some of the check-in to help with like the rapid testing and stuff like that. So that might help nurse, us. We have a couple of nursing schools around us that we may explore doing that. And we, uh, we actually started using pharmacy students and pharmacists for the med check-in procedure and creating Mars and counting and stuff like that for just check-in day. And what do you do with them? How does that, can, can I ask that? Cause this is a question I always am interested with, with in. The, with the pharmacy students? Yeah. So we, yeah, so we basically have a team for, uh, we have four check-in teams and each one consists of a nurse. And if we have them, a pharmacist tech, and they divvy up when the meds are distributed, counting up the meds, making the bags for each of the distributions uh, and, and creating the Mars all at the same time. Great. Uh, Great. And do you, you use sealed, the sealed bags? Yeah. Can I, this is maybe a dumb question, so forgive me, but how do you contain all of those bags? That's been my thought, because I've been wanting to switch to the bags, but I can't figure out when you have like a zillion little bags for a kid, how do you, do you have little boxes for each kid or? Yeah, so the bags go into bigger bags, go into bigger bags, go into a cabin bin. So, okay. just, so meals to days to kid to cabin. I'm trying to figure out the perfect way of doing it because the bags. Well, there's no perfect way, but no, that's, I know, that's I know. where we are today. But It'll I know. be different next year, but that's that's basically the idea. Yeah, no, we, we just do. feel like slipping through lots of plastic bags. It gets so crazy because they're just sliding all over the place. We do little bags into a big bag per kid that goes into a cabin um, tub. I can't think yeah. of the word. You know, yeah. that storage yeah. tub basically that's labeled with either a cabin or a cohort and the nurse that's assigned to that group just keeps that with them. They keep their Mars in there unless it's narcotic or something scheduled and then that's locked up separately. But yeah. For regular meds. Uh, you had asked about like taking kids on treatment or if we changed anything, we aren't gonna change anything, but we've never done, for example, like, like IV chemo or blood transfusions or anything at camp. So ours okay. has pretty much been, you know, we'll do oral meds. Oral meds, okay. So we're, we're going to stick with our camp group and what we've done on site, but we've always been a bit minimal because we're a little bit out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And the hospital nearby is a small hospital We're you know, we're two hours from the oncology center. So oh, yeah. we've chosen to keep pretty minimal what we do on site. Maybe we just all need to fly around and help each other. I know. That's <laughs> Quite honestly, what I'm looking forward to is the medical roundtable at COCA because we all will have lots of things to say. How did your summer go? So, well, and just know that if I don't get to have camp, I'm going to be bugging all y'all <laughs> to find out exactly how it went. Tammy, come to Arizona in June. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like the whole thing is really a bit like going to Vegas, but. <laughs> Vegas is a very popular place, actually. Yeah. And I think people are willing. I think the national feeling is people are willing to be exposed to this and deal with the consequences. Mm. Um, I can't see it any other way from what I from my point of view. But yeah. Um, yeah, I'm still not convinced about long COVID about what that really is going to mean. So I've, that's why I've been in my living room for two and a half years now, but just trying to avoid so far I've dodged the bullet, but we'll see. Well, we just dove right in. My husband's dealing with long COVID from 2020 and he's doing okay. Good. Keeping on, keeping on. And I just had Omicron in February and he didn't get it and he didn't that's isolate. Good. Like, it's like the five blind men and the elephant, right? They're all having a different experience. Everyone's having a different experience. It is Everybody true. Everybody knows what it's all about. <laughs> and I'm giving people the benefit of the doubt here in Arizona because there's no rules or laws. My main problem is to make sure people aren't 
you know, carrying their guns on the camp property. Like they want to see the rules that say I'm not allowed to carry when I've got a, you know, what do they call those permits? Concealed. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's my main problem. <laughs> Never mind COVID. You know, <laughs> concealed permit gun things that I'm like, <laughs> you know. That's a whole other medical town. Hall. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, you know, I've been doing these for a while. I'm not quite sure that has ever come up before. You um, yeah. Oh really? It hasn't come up. No, I don't. In anybody's about, camp. Well, I don't know about a camp. I don't think it's ever come up as a question though for um, gun control. No, I mean our oh camp is right in South Dakota, so. I, it wasn't in my policy. It was not in my policy. People put it in your policies. I yeah, needed yeah. to prove that was part of the rules. And I was like, it's not even on my policy, not even addressed, but now it is. So are, yeah. do you mean like for parents coming on site to drop people off? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, we do a family camp. So they know oh. there's bears and sure. characters up in the mountains and I just want to make sure it's okay with you that I'm, you know, carrying my gun because I have a concealed permit, you know, and um, I'm like, ah, <laughs> I, I actually checked with the camp property. Uh, we rent. So I figured they probably had a rule. And fortunately they did because I did not, but now I do. I'm updating my gold ribbon every day. <laughs> yeah. That's what we do with our camp property is. Yeah, there no guns, no drugs, no smoking, no yeah. drinking. Well, I had no smoking. Then somebody's vaping all weekend. And I'm like, oh, I don't have vaping listed in there. Oh, that's, yeah. Welcome and to vaping. Georgia. Well, welcome to Georgia. That's pretty hard. We just signed <laughs> into law. You don't need a permit to carry a concealed weapon. Yeah. Oh, no. oh Lord. I'm going so back to New Zealand. <laughs> Other questions or unique challenges people have? Um, Is anyone using a, uh, a platform for staff training or whether it be medical or, you know, just all of the changes surrounding cohorts and all of this, um, the fact that we will have new staff and returning staff that had different expectations. Are there any, what are you doing? Are you making, are you putting together your own training protocols or are you using different platforms third party these things have an expiration date on them <laughs> those are beverly's tests she got um, cindy i'll be honest 200 I tests today <laughs> so if you want to come to pima county they're just throwing them out the windows and doors as cindy i have to be honest as medical director that's not a part that i end up having a ton of input into. Uh, I think we're going to do still mostly on site, though, just to explain. Um, let's see, looks like he just said they've been doing monthly training with the staff to go over all the new protocols. Mm -hmm. Ryan, that's great. We have, we've had a couple of webinars that will address this, right? Ryan? Yep. And uh, in two weeks, we have Dave Malter that is going to be doing um, staff training. I'm not sure he's going to be doing anything COVID specific, but he is giving us um, sort of best practices from the time they're hired to the time they start working. So um, I can bring up that question to him to kind of how to explain COVID. I know at our camp last year, I just did it right away. It was, I had a, like a fun thing to kind of get the staff going. And then I immediately did the thing everybody didn't want to do and just had the COVID discussion. And the staff was really, really open to it. But I think it's because I overly communicated what to expect going into it. And so it's like they already knew what to do and how to handle each situation before we even got there. I don't think you can over emphasize any of this stuff. And I think, so I think that's great. I mean, I, you know, I'm like, okay, that it's not in my line of authority to, to figure out what to do. But I was planning on doing the same thing with medical staff in terms of just starting early and having some stuff posted on a website. So like we have a big box account so that they could access it and watch it. Um, and then so that they can get it in their heads because giving it more than once, you know, if you try to wait till right before camp and say, okay, here's everything you need to know and doing all of your other mandatory training that you have to do, 
it's just too much information. Plus people are all amped up about camp. But I guess my, my thing would be, I could see it being easier to mandate and get compliance with people who are hired for the summer. But when you have all volunteer, has anybody had any problems with that for an all volunteer training staff? Especially for, we are all volunteer and, and uh, for people who come back year after year, who the first thing they do is want to hug everyone. Like I, I see where the pre-camp training is a must because yeah. it's embedded in their DNA to, to immediately be together. And this whole cohorting is, is, I don't think anyone, even though we've already started, you know, talking and, and um, really trying to give a visual I don't think anyone has really gotten their head around what it will feel like to arrive at camp and see some of their friends from for 10 years that this is and not be able to even get within us, you know, to social distance right from that moment of arrival, you know, so it's um, and I guess it's just something some of you have already done it, you know, and it's something that just has to be experienced and uh, a lot of the pre-training ahead of time will have to be extremely specific. Susan, what did you give for treats at your station? She had put in the chat that they did <laughs> eight stations and they got a treat for everyone they went to. I'm we curious, what you brought them with? Yeah, we had a variety of things. We had some chip snack, that kind of snack. We had some candy bars, just a little different at every station. So some stations, they got their little hand sanitizer. and um, But most of the time, it was just some goodies that they would have throughout the week to eat. So that was kind of nice for them. Great. I was going to mention how important I think the pre-camp health screening is. So last year we did daily health screening for 10 days leading up to camp. We're actually going to do five days this year, but by doing that, um, we actually eliminated people coming to camp sick. So we did have to do some cancellations of both a few campers as well as, um, a few staff members leading up to camp, but everybody then came in healthy. There was no these, well, my cold's almost gone and mm -hmm. um, you know all this other stuff. We had one kid that tested positive for paraflu a few days before camp, which we definitely didn't want to um, have brought into camp. And so again, it was a daily, everybody got a daily prompter on their email or text and it took about 30 seconds to do. It was a couple quick questions. If there was any, kind of flag, it, then I followed up with them and talked through what was going on and made some recommendations. But it, we, everybody came in healthy, which was great. I would definitely recommend it. So a little bit of, well, it's, I guess this is kind of on the topic. Um, we, in the past, have done like a family program, you know, and had an area or a time where we'd honor our graduates for the campers that were aging out. Is anyone doing anything like that? Or how are you doing some of those really well-loved traditions that are pretty tough to pull off in COVID situations? We made new traditions last year. Okay. We didn't do our annual boat day. We didn't do our dance. Um, you know, we didn't have visitors to camp didn't even let our donors or her. yeah I already told our and foundation yet you invited staff, me no visitors no donors sorry not happening <laughs> yeah I'm I putting agree. you to work Tammy <laughs> <laughs> so our we board doesn't our, work when they come to camp <laughs> we still had our prom last year uh, we just made it outdoors in this huge field area and we <laughs> had it uh, um, it was a silent disco and then we still had our aging out ceremony where everybody's in a big circle. They just st stood with their cohorts instead of all with each other as a big group. Um, so my one of my biggest lessons last year was that you can adapt any one of your traditions if you just put your mind to it. There, we, we did a pool party last year and it was just, the pool just happened to be one station of a larger activity and the kids loved it. Um, the kids like doing new things is also something that we learned. We just, you know, we get so caught up in doing the same thing year after year after year. And sometimes the kids are like, whoa, this is way better when we don't have to do it. Um, and we found that with our visitors last year too. The kids 
I don't think there was one kid that mentioned, oh, how come the pirate people didn't come do pirate day? It's just they, they adapted extremely well. I'm getting more pushback from the parents who want to be able to be part of the graduation or more I, disappointment is what I should say, not pushback. Cause I think we can do some things for the kids. You know, in the past there'd be parents and grandparents and siblings. And I don't know if we're going to try to live stream it. I'm not sure what we're going to do, but that's been a little bit of um, some disappointment and, and comments that we've had is I'm going to miss his camp graduation. Oh, well, sorry. And we, I have a, prom plan next week for 80 teenagers. It's a facility that's big outdoor patio, big in uh -oh. Beverly, you froze. Unless it's just me. No, I had the same thing happen. I thought it was me too, but no. Oh. oh, funny. Oh, well. There you go. <laughs> You're back. All right. Um, yeah, I think here, People are just really making their own decisions and being willing to tolerate the consequences of them. And so I'm really leaving it up to individuals to make decisions about whether they participate or not. I think everyone knows the consequences of it, the um, potential for exposure, and I'm really just going with the flow here. Well, and I think one of the discussions we kind of had was similar to what Susan was saying is, you know, we just made new traditions. And, and when you think about that, it's been three years since anybody, for us, it would be, or four years that anybody's been to camp, it might be a whole new population of campers, and they're not going to know what the traditions are. And it's just, you know, the staff. And so it's, we had to kind of stop and ask ourselves too, like, uh, you know, when someone says, well, is that really camp? Well, it's not our you know, we don't have to worry about how we feel about it. It's about how the kids are going to feel about it. So we shouldn't impose our adult, you know, our adult priorities or, our, you know, what we're going to miss onto the kids. But good point. All right. So we're coming up at about five minutes left of the hour. Anyone have a last question or idea you wanted to throw out? But Edith did ask, uh, I think, Susan, uh, who made your pre-camp okay. test? That one you were talking about. For the staff training, I think, yeah. I think, I think that's what it's for. So we did, nope. uh, we didn't do a test. We did two, we did two videos. One um, was done by the um, camp director and one was done by me. So she focused on kind of one aspect and then I touched base on a lot of the safety strategies and just a little bit on mesh and the importance of kind of bringing your best self to camp um, for the counselors. Because I think that's the other thing they keep talking about is just the mental health related issues that you could yeah. see. We didn't see any last year, but we only had our kids together for three days. Um, that was our, we did short sessions. And so I don't think they were there long enough to start seeing a lot of escalation, but we definitely are preparing for that a little bit more this year. Um, and then from our, our walkthrough scenarios, um, we just had the eight different stations that they just kind of went through. So from our health screening test, if that's what you were referring to, um, the company that we use for testing also has a screening tool. And so we worked with them to send out our screening tools. kind of one-stop shopping there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Don't forget our session next week. Um, and then we have another one, actually two weeks for the staff training as Ryan brought up. So remember that this will be posted online and outside the box so you can see this or share with others if they didn't get a chance to join tonight. The chat will be part of that as well. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks everybody. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Tammy. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. That was great.